Welcome to the University of Nottingham. For centuries, indeed almost from the time that Christian theology began in the latter half of the first century, Christian theologians have been using Plato, the Greek philosopher. Might seem strange. Plato lived centuries before Jesus. He was a Greek. He knew nothing of Israel. He had many thoughts that were very different to the ones that Christians take for granted. So, Simon, why study Plato? Well, Plato uh, lived in the fourth century BC in ancient Greece, um, and he is, I think, by far the most important philosopher of, of the philosophical tradition. So the 20th century philosopher, Ian Whitehead, famously said that all Western philosophy is simply footnotes to Plato. And I think if one's looking for a single philosophical tradition, not necessarily the texts of Plato himself, but a, a tradition that has influenced Christian theology the most, then one looks to Plato, to the traditions that came from his works, a Middle Platonism and Neoplatonism, and the way that they helped Christian theologians think through the meaning and implications of, of the teaching that they received and were forming through the church. And there are some very important reasons why that's the case and if I can outline a few of them. I think a good place to start is, is Plato's metaphysics, his understanding of the nature of existence and truth and, and allied to that his notion of knowledge. And if we want to know about that then most obviously we go back to Plato's very famous doctrine of the forms. And we find that in his dialogue, The Republic, which is a work, particularly political philosophy, but he's interested also in metaphysics, ideas of existence, uh, and not the nature of, of knowledge as well, epistemology. And what Plato says is that we live in a, a realm of what he calls becoming, of flux and change. So the, the, the material realm, realm that we live in, one thing is always becoming another. Things are always changing. Uh, acorns become oaks, boys become men, and so on and so forth. And that this instability, if you like, this constant flux and change means that we can't always completely firmly grasp something. And because things change, because they are becoming, one thing becoming another, they're not completely knowable. We can't fix things down. But things do have a measure of stability. It's not as if we don't know anything about the material realm in which we live. It's not chaos. It does seem to exhibit a measure of order, of reason. And Plato wants to know, well, where does that stability, that order come from? Where does the structure of this realm of becoming originate from? What does it owe it to? And so he postulates what's known as the realm of the forms or the realm of being, which is an eternal realm of ideals or exemplars in which individual things in this realm participate or share. So, you know, the horse running in the field has as an exemplar in, in uh, the form of horse. You and I have as exemplars the form of human being, the form of man. There is a stable and eternal reality that the realm of becoming shares in or participates in. And eventually, Plato says that there is one supreme form, the form of the good, and it's sharing in goodness that makes things most supremely knowable and intelligible. So we see this reflected in the way that we commonly talk about someone, for example, who is a good friend. He is a good friend to me. This is a good chair. This is a good horse. This is a good field. What we mean by using the word good is that this is identifiable as a friend rather than an enemy, a horse rather than a cow, a field rather than a mountain, and so on and so forth. That th this is, in other words, the thing that we call good is being what it ought to be, and that makes it intelligible and knowable. This is sharing in goodness, and so the good is allied to what makes things rational and ordered. And this gives Christian theologians a kind of philosophical framework in which to try and understand the relationship between God and creation. So what they will say is that it's sharing in the goodness of God 
that makes creation good and makes it therefore rational and intelligible. And this is, if you like, the basis of our, our whole science that we do today, that, that things are ordered, if you like, to, to be certain things ordered to particular kinds of ends and so on. But also supremely that um, what Plato taught is that what exists fundamentally is not what we see around us, these, you know, the flux and change of the material world, but what exists eternally and in a most stable fashion, never waxing or waning, is the realm of the forms and, and the form of the good. And so Christian theologians then take this, this, the structure of this, this metaphysics and say, well, we need to think about God as existing most supremely in himself, eternally, neither waxing nor waning, the unchanging God, in which the flux and change and becoming of creation share. And so you get this, this notion of creation participating or sharing in the eternal stability of the God who creates it. Now, interestingly, a lot of textbook, treat, textbook treatments of Plato will therefore describe Plato as what we call a dualist. So they will say that there are two distinct spheres standing over and against each other, the eternal realm of the forms and the visible realm of becoming that we inhabit. And these two realms form dual realms, a dualism standing over and against each other. The classic instance in the philosophical tradition of dualism is Descartes in, in the 17th century in his description of the way that mind and body relate as dual aspects of, of human beings. And trying to connect the two for Descartes is very, very difficult. So you have this idea that mind and body, in a sense, are juxtaposed to each other, but somehow exist in a single human being. And so people trace this back to Plato and this dualism between the realm of the forms, the realm of being and the realm of becoming. And people think that Plato is likewise a soul-body dualist in the same way that Descartes is a mind-body dualist. Now, I think this is a, a, a misreading of Plato mm. because the key point about Plato is that the realm of the eternal realm of the forms and of being does not stand over and against the material realm of becoming. The whole point is that the material realm of becoming, the visible realm that we inhabit, always depends for its existence on its sharing in, its participation in, the realm of being, the realm of the forms and the good. So they don't stand over and against each other, but one always is sharing in, participating in the other. And this gives Christian theologians later a way of talking about creations sharing in God, that God and creation don't stand over and against each other, they're not two things, but creation always is, as it were, in God, participating in God. Well, as you know, I would share that reading of Plato, but before I, I want to explore that, but before that I want to take you to another question. Uh, end of the second century and the early third century, Tertullian, father of Latin theology, utters a famous question, quid Athene hero salima? What has Athens to do with Jerusalem? Mm. And you know, it's a phrase, it's used by, down the centuries, philosophy, theology, belief, Greece, Athens, faith, Jerusalem. And if somehow they get together, well, they will contaminate, they'll destroy. And this is a problem, and I think it's a problem mainly for the reform tradition, mm. who, 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 who seem to use this juxtapose Athens, Jerusalem. Mm. Well, it, it's an obvious question because if you just look at the genre of the literature, if you look at the, the narrative and poetry of, of the Hebrew scriptures compared to the, uh, the logical ordering of treaties that come from ancient Greece in the tradition of philosophy, they just look very, very different. And there is uh, relatively recently, I have to say, this idea that there was a pristine biblical theology that was uninfected by Greek metaphysics. And still today you'll find people arguing that the doctrine of God that comes out of Greek metaphysics, the unchanging God, the immutable God, the eternal God, is just not the God of the Old Testament, mm. who is involved in history and so on and so forth. Now I think that this is, 
this is a complete misreading of the tradition. There, there quite simply never was a pure, unadulterated biblical theology that was then infected by Greek metaphysics. There's always a crossing over. You can read it, it, it right from Paul's missionary and, journeys. And um, human beings are, in, are inevitably metaphysical. Ex exactly. And people, people in Jerusalem could do metaphysics as well Exa as people exactly. in, in Athens. Exactly. So what they're doing is they're using the tradition of Greek metaphysics to think about the, the meaning and implications of what they read from Scripture. Can I take you now to another, and just this is my last question. Uh, creation participates in the good and so participates in God. Mm -hmm. One of the great ways that Plato has influenced theology, I'm thinking of Augustine, I'm thinking of Eugenia, mm -hmm. I'm thinking of little schoolmasters between those two, like Eucarius of Lyon, the universe is sacramental. Right. So the idea that the universe is sacramental is the idea that the universe is, in a sense, um, a system of signs that points beyond itself to, to what is eternal, what is more real. That is what we might call a sacramental ontology. What are things really? What's their being? What, what's their nature? Their nature is to point beyond themselves to, to what is eternal uh, and to, their, to their, the origin of their existence. But the, the key and, and I think very um, intriguing thought that comes from that is this, that when we think about creation, commonly what we imagine is that there is one thing, God, and God creates, and then there are two things, God plus creation. Now this tradition of Platonic philosophy that so influenced Christian theology says that's not the way to think about it. The way to think about it is that there is only ever one existent. There is only one focus of being, and that is God. Everything else shares in that. Everything else is a participation in it. So there are not two things. There's only ever one thing, which is God, and all other things as a reflection or a participation in that. You find that in Plato's simile of the sun, um, that there is one source of illumination, and all other things are made knowable by that source of illumination. And there's the lovely image in St. Augustine that everything in the creation then has the footprints, the yeah. vestigia, the and you, yeah. can trace the, you can trace the footprints back. Yep. But this will radically affect our, our, our imagination, our religious imagination, if you like, if we realize that God is not just another thing alongside the universe, um, that the universe is, as you say, a sacrament of, a, a sign of, that which created it. Simon, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>